Well, good morning. We'll get, we'll get going. If you've got your Bibles with you, electronic or paper, we'll be in Colossians chapter 2 if you want to start getting there. And I, I think I mentioned, I think I've mentioned before that, that I was raised, and, and I know I've talked to several of y'all here, uh, many of us were raised, I know not all of us, uh, but many of us were raised in conservative churches of Christ. I was raised in conservative churches of Christ, and saying that is like piling conservatism on top of conservatism on top of conservatism, because uh, already within the, uh, the Christian faith, uh, for the most part, the Christian faith as a whole would be, as the world would see it, a little more on the conservative side. And then within the Christian faith, there are, there are groups that are more uh, conservative and groups that are more progressive, right? They're, and so the churches of Christ traditionally have been a little more on the conservative end. And then of the churches of Christ that are on that more conservative end, I was in the conservative churches of Christ. So I was in the conservative churches of a conservative group of a conservative faith. That's just kind of where, um, where I was raised and where I, where I grew up. And on these extreme edges, and, and I wasn't on the extreme, extreme, extreme edge, almost the fall off the end kind of edge, but if, if as the world would look at it, and maybe even as Christendom would look at it as a whole, uh, I was pretty far over uh, to the right. And, and I'm not saying conservatism is better or worse than being more progressive. Just people are somewhere, right? We're, we're all kind of somewhere on that spectrum. And one of the things, though, about being, well, really being anywhere is that we can have a, a slanted view of things. We can have a slanted view of things because our, the way we see the world, the way we interpret the world, the way we look at things and the way we behave is based on a lot of things from our lives. And a lot of those things include, we've talked about these on Wednesdays and previous Sundays, but you know, life experiences have, have shaped how we see things. Uh, what we were taught growing up has shaped how we've seen things. Uh, and just other things about our lives, it, it shapes us and it shapes the way we see things. And that becomes what's known as our worldview. Uh, we all have a worldview. This is kind of the way we look at the world. Well, that worldview that's built from our experiences, things we've been taught and a lot of other stuff, is also that lens through which we interpret Scripture. And we've been talking about this on Wednesday nights in our How to Read the Bible class. And there's a filter, and that filter is our worldview is it, it influences how we look at Scripture and how we read Scripture and what we, we pull out of Scripture. And what we've been talking about on Wednesday nights is what we want to do is we want to read Scripture responsibly. right? I, I want to use what the Bible gives us. I want to use it for me. I want to use it for y'all as, as I teach. We want to use it responsibly. right? We, we want to use wisdom when we're talking about uh, biblical things, um, we want to just we want to use it. We want to use it well. But too many times in our lives, we are guilty of and and unknowingly. I'm not saying there's malicious intent here. Unknowingly approach Scripture with this slanted view of things, whichever you know way we might be slanted. Everybody's slanted. I'm a little slanted, weirder than most people, right? Um, but wh whatever it is about our lives, we approach Scripture and we, we try to squeeze God into this box, into my worldview of the way things, in my mind, the way things should be. Uh, that we try to interpret Scripture with this, here's the way I would like it kind of point of view. And, and that can muddy the waters many times. And when we start off in Scripture with that kind of slanted view either that a slanted view of God or a slanted view of Jesus or a slanted view of the way things should be, then you're really starting off, I'm starting off, on bad footing, right? We want to be even keeled, as people would say. We want to have a firm and solid foundation. We don't want to be overly slanted and biased towards how I think things should be, right? And you don't want to be overly biased about the way you think things should be. We want to be wise about these things. 
Well, this is the same kind of thing that the Colossians are running into, and one of the primary reasons, if not the primary reason, why Paul has written this letter to the Colossians. He's, he's got some information from this guy named Epaphras who's visited him in prison about the church in Colossae, and he says, hey, here's what's going on. Everything's going pretty well. They're doing great. They're still a young church, but there's some social pressures that that they're facing. There's, there's some people from different points of view pressing a worldview on them that is, is causing them to be slanted and, and maybe pushing or pulling them in a different direction. Last week, we looked at Colossians uh, chapter 2, verse 8. We, just, we really just kind of camped on that verse. We talked about some of the stuff before, but we camped on that verse where Paul said, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human traditions and the elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather, he says, rather than on Christ. Paul doesn't want these people to be deceived into doing something. In one case, he doesn't want them to be deceived into doing something just because that's the way it's always been done. That's the way some Jewish people were probably pushing them to say, hey, you know, the old law and circumcision and food, you know, you can only eat certain foods and you can't eat other foods and all these, you know, religious days and things like that, that they were saying, this is the way it's always been. And Paul does not want them to be deceived into doing things that way just because that's the way it's always been because something has changed. The other thing is that he doesn't want them to be deceived into doing something because of these elemental spiritual forces. And we talked about there's a couple of options about what that could mean. One of those is this: uh, the world was filled with mostly a polytheistic faith. We kind of see our world, definitely the, the Western world, as primarily, although that's kind of changing, but primarily Christian. Most people, you know, we kind of go, well, who... Who can I tell about Jesus? I think most people have at least heard of Jesus. That's not exactly true, even in our community, but we kind of get this idea that most people have a general idea about Jesus. They may not know a lot. They may have just heard of him, but they they have a general idea. Well, these people lived in a world where the primary faith was a polytheistic, this many gods faith. And there's kind of this, this God of the harvest and this God of uh, you know, the wind and the rain and a God of the oceans and maybe God of fire and things like that. And they had this idea that maybe they needed to appease these gods in an agricultural society when they're planting things and they're wanting the harvest to come. They're like, maybe I need to go you know, appease this God of harvest and so I'll go down to the temple of whoever it was and, and do the thing that they tell you to do. Uh, so that's one thing that might be these elemental spiritual forces. He's, he's like, don't, you know, you, you don't need that. You don't need that. Or the other option, the word elemental also has the same root word of elementary. It also could be these elementary basic teachings, which still may be that kind of polyistic thing, or it could be elementary teachings about faith. But in either way, he's saying, I want you to mature past those. It's, it's great to get some basic understanding right when you start off, but, but you need to be growing. You need to be growing in your faith. And so uh, now Paul uh, is going to shift where we're at this morning. Paul's going to shift his focus to Jesus as he does over and over again in this book, in this letter. Again, it's a letter. We're reading someone else's mail, the, the mail to these people that live in this town, Colossae that are Christians. It's a letter to the Christians in Colossae. That's what we're reading here. Someone else's mail. And so he, um, what he does in this, in this letter is he bounces back and forth between a word of encouragement or a word of caution and Jesus. A word of encouragement, a word of caution, and Jesus. And he keeps going back and forth and back and forth between these things. And we'll see that this morning because if I do a super quick review, at the beginning, at our first week, we talked about Paul's prayer. Paul has this prayer for the Colossian churches. There's, there's some things that he says, I pray for you about these. And there, there was four of them. He wants them to continue to grow and mature. He wants them to live worthy. He wants them to uh, not be confused. Uh, and he, he wants them, the last one is he wants them to derive their strength from God. Those are the four things that he prays for them about. He says, I want this for you. I hope for this for you. This is what, this is what you need. 
And then he bounces to this why, which is Jesus, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago, because in your Bible, you had a, a heading there in the middle of chapter one. It says something about like the supremacy of Jesus or something like that. And Paul, uh, it's kind of like a poem. He, he goes on this kind of poetry kind of thing to talk about Jesus and the why behind Jesus, because Jesus is supreme over all things, because everything was created by him and through him and for him. That, that nothing is beyond his influence, and eventually everything, everything, everything that's been created, either in heaven or on earth, every person, every man, woman, and child, every animal, creature, fish, every plant, every speck of dirt, every rock, every drip of water, is going to be under the authority of Jesus. It's under the authority of Jesus, but one day everything will answer and submit to that authority. So he said, here's my prayer for you. I want these things for you. And here's why, because Jesus is supreme. And then he goes back and starts talking about where they're deriving their strength from. I don't want you to be deceived right, by these, these, these uh, philosophies based on human tradition uh, or these elemental spiritual forces. So he's back with a warning or whatever. And then today, we're going to pick up with the why. Why is it that uh, they need to not derive their strength from tradition? Why is it they need to not derive their strength from these elemental spiritual forces or these elementary, elementary, nah, nah, elementary teachings? Why is it? And so that's where we get to Colossians 2, verse 9. And it's for this reason. Because in Christ, all the fullness of the deity, deity is God, in Christ, the fullness of God lives in bodily form. And kind of echoing back to this, um, this poem that he did in, in chapter 1, uh, where he said he is the image of the invisible God. Somehow, some way, some mysterious way that I don't completely understand, the fullness of God is encapsulated in this man, Jesus, and it's God presented to us in a way that we can handle, in a way that we can process. We talked about how you know, no one can stand before God or see God and live. It would I don't know what it is about it. It would, it would just kill us. Uh, just not, not as a punishment, but just the overwhelming nature of it, it would just kill us. Um, but in Jesus, there's this fullness of God, but delivered in a way that we can handle and we can manage. And in Christ, he says, you have been brought to fullness. And this is probably, I think in this section that we're looking at today, the biggest thing, I mean, we're, here we are, we're two minutes, I don't know how far we're into this lesson, but this is the biggest thing that you can take away from today's lesson. That in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. It's in Christ. Fullness comes in Jesus. It doesn't come in, because he just talked about tradition, these elemental spiritual, it doesn't come in tradition. It doesn't come in a bunch of rules. It doesn't come in doing it the same way all the time. It doesn't come by making sure that you get it right. Fullness doesn't come uh, even from these traditions. And we'll see next week how Paul's going to talk about how it, in the big scheme of things, these traditions aren't even really helpful. Right? They're not even really helpful. We'll talk about that next week. But you're also not going to find um, fullness in other gods. You're not going to find fullness in other gods. Now, today we wouldn't say, well, I'm not worried about the God of the harvest or the God of rain or whatever, but there are things in our lives that if we're not careful, we can, and worship isn't even a, a strong word, but it's basically that same thing. We can direct all our attention and all our focus and all our energy into things that basically are like gods to us. Today we would say things like job security. And Paul's saying you cannot find fullness, or fullness comes in Jesus. It doesn't come in job security. It doesn't come in possessions or money. Fullness doesn't come in our, in our physique or our, our beauty. Some of us are blessed to be more beautiful than others, right? Okay. Um, not in our, in our youth. I wasn't talking about myself, by the way. I was talking about you guys, right? Um, not in our youth, right? We, we're not, uh, uh, fullness doesn't come in these other things. And here's the things you here's the, the thing about this is you don't and I don't bring ourselves you don't bring yourself to fullness and I don't bring myself to fullness. 
You can try. You could spend your life spinning your wheels and spinning your wheels and spinning your wheels trying to accumulate enough of whatever it is you think will bring you fullness. You can accumulate enough wealth. You can cum accumulate enough property. You can accumulate enough stature at your work or in your community. You can accumulate enough relationships, that enough people like you. You can accumulate enough... Um, Physique, you know, you can work yourself out to death. And, I'm not, and, and none of these things I'm saying are wrong. I'm not saying if, if, if you look good, which some of y'all really do, right? I'm not saying if you look good, if you're young, if you, you know, people love you because something about you is just awesome, or maybe you work out a lot and so you're physically fit or whatever. I'm not saying those things are bad, and I'm not saying they, they aren't things that might be good to do in our lives. But what I'm saying is those are not the things that will bring fullness, you can never, and you never will, no matter how much effort you put into it, bring yourself fullness because Jesus is the one who brings you to fullness. It is through Jesus that we are brought or made full. He is the head over every power and authority. He is before all things, preeminence over everything. So we talk about superior, he's superior over all things things and in him all things hold together everything is by him everything is in him and everything in this world in all of creation in the whole universe is because of him everything verse 11 in him you were also circumcised there's a circumcision talk in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands your whole self ruled by the flesh, and when he says the flesh here, Paul's typically talking about the sinful nature, not, you know, not my skin, but the sinful nature that resides in our body. Your whole self ruled by the sinful nature was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Now you might be saying, well, when was I circumcised by Christ? I don't remember that happening, right? You're kind of like, yeah. Um, well, when did this happen? We just go to the next verse, verse 12. Uh, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God. That's super important, the working of God, uh, who raised him, Jesus, from the dead. And this is very much, I mean, this is Paul. This is Paul. He's This is the same kind of language he uses over and over again. He uses it in Romans chapter 6. He talks about all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that or so that uh, just as Jesus Christ, as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may rise. He doesn't say that, but we too may live a new life. There's a new life that comes from what Paul's talking about here in Colossians about this circumstance or the circumcision. There's a new life that comes from that. And faith, just, just to talk about faith and baptism for, for a moment, because I think this does tie into this whole discussion that Paul's talking about here, especially when he talks about the traditions and the way things have always been and things like that. For the first century, at least, in, in the biblical times, the New Testament times, um, faith in Jesus and baptism went hand in hand. If you read through the book of Acts, everywhere there was a conversion, everywhere someone said, you know what, that stuff you're telling me about Jesus is right, or I heard and I saw, or whatever, every conversion story in the book of Acts, as it's talking about the early church, includes a baptism in that. But I think it's also important for us to understand that the primary saving thing is our faith in Jesus. The primary saving thing is our faith in Jesus because it is, it's a heart thing. And God's always been interested in the heart. It's always been about the heart. It's a heart thing, not a practice thing or make sure you check all the boxes kind of thing. He says in verse 13, and I'll explain a little bit more of that in just a minute. In verse 13, he says, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, again, this uncircumcision of the sinful nature, God, in that moment, made you alive with Christ. In that moment, it's kind of like that while we were sinners. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Or as he says it here, while you were dead in your sins, God made you alive with Christ. 
the sinful nature, that sinful nature that was still somehow connected to us, clinging to us as the word circumcision needed to be cut off, the sinful nature was still stuck to us. We read about that in Romans, Romans 3, all have sinned. All have sinned. Everybody, every person on the planet who ever has lived, is living, or will live, everybody has sinned. And um, Romans 6, but the wage of sin is death. In Colossians here, he's saying, but God made us alive through Jesus. God made us alive through Jesus. We deserved death. The wage was death. We were guilty of sin, but God made us alive. And how did this happen? The next verse, or next part of the verse, he forgave us all our sins. It's probably the second most important, or maybe it's the equal with the other. He forgave us all our sins. And this is one I think is very difficult for us to carry sometimes. I know it's difficult for me to carry sometimes. All our sins means all our sins here. Not a few of our sins, not just the easy low-level sins, not just the sins that nobody really knows about or the sins that people do know about, however you want to look at it. It's, it's not just some, it's not just most of our sins. It is all. All. Wear that Carry that home with you. Get a backpack and put it in and carry it around with you all week. God, through Jesus, forgave you of all past, present, future, your sins. Having, in verse 14, canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. There was a legal indebtedness in the old law. There was a legal indebtedness. And this indebtedness stood against us and it condemned us. And it says He has taken it away and he nailed it to a cross. There was something. I didn't bring a prop or something. You know, you, you, you owed me a little cup of water or whatever. You know, you owed it to me for some reason. I don't know. Maybe I mowed your yard, right? And you owed me a cup. I said, I'll mow your yard if you give me a cup of water. He said, sure. And you never gave it to me. <laughs> I said, you know what? Don't worry about it. You know, that, that's kind of what, what God did. He, he's, like, he's like, by your faith in Jesus, he's nailed this thing to the cross. Jesus was the legal payment for our legal debt. All of it is in and through Jesus. And like I said a minute ago, it's it's about the heart. It's it's always been about the heart. Let me me explain that. When we talk about circumcision, you know, obvious things come to mind, but specifically we talk about the old law and how the old law, the, the Jewish people, the Israelite people, the, the men were supposed to be circumcised and like by the eighth day and, and whatever and, and all that was going on. But, um, but it's, it's sometimes like saying like, like this is like different from that. You know, we, we would look at this thing in Colossians and what Paul's talking about. We go, yeah, yeah, but that, this is different than that. Back then, we were talking about this kind of physical circumcision. That's not what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about circumcision of the heart, right? Cutting off of the sinful nature, all that kind of stuff. That, that what we're talking about here, it uses the same word, but it's, it's different than that. I want to tell you, it's not different than that. It's not different at all. It's not just an analogy. It's the way things were always supposed to be. Uh, the circumcision back then was supposed to point people to the circumcision that Paul is talking about here in Colossians. And I, I could show you this in several different places. Uh, three, I'll give you three from the Old Testament. Leviticus 26. Leviticus 26 talks about, <clears throat> excuse me, talks about circumcision of the heart. See, sometimes we think that maybe the circumcision of the heart language is New Testament stuff. In Old Testament stuff, they talked about real circumcision, right? No. In Leviticus, it talks about circumcision of the heart. Deuteronomy 10 talks about, he says, circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer, or do not be hard-hearted, is another way it might be said. Or in Deuteronomy 30, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all of your heart and with all of your soul and live. The circumcision that happened back then was never about physical circumcision it never was the intent and and i don't know how that all plays out but the intent was to be in the minds of the people that it it's what matters is is my heart and i need to cut off those things those places where i seek fulfillment that don't come from god i need to cut them off i need to and again i'm not saying 
you know, quit work. everybody quit work tomorrow, right? I'm not saying that. I'm not saying stop working out. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying stop, you know, loving and interacting with people and making friends. I'm not saying that. But the place of fulfillment is in Jesus, in our hearts. Now, this stiff, stiff-necked, let me show you how that kind of plays out. Also, like the, the language of a hard heart. If you want to go back to Exodus and read about the people, the, the Israelite people are enslaved in Egypt, right? They're, they're enslaved in Egypt under Pharaoh. Moses is called by God to go in and talk to Pharaoh and tell, tell Pharaoh to let my people go, right? And, and he's hopefully going to let him go. And over and over again, when Moses talks to him, it says Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And what's going on there is this, this sinful nature or this place of fulfillment. Pharaoh's place of fulfillment was not in God. His, his place where he sought fulfillment was in economic conquest, was building structures. And the way to get those buildings built was how? Through slave labor of the Israelite people. The reason Pharaoh didn't want to let him go is not just because well, I guess it was kind of, he was stingy, but it wasn't just because he wasn't a nice guy. It's because his heart was hardened. Where he found fulfillment was this, in this economic progress, this, this building of buildings. And the way to get that done was through slave labor. And so I'm not letting them go because I find fulfillment in this and I'm going to keep after it. Until God made it so painful for him, he's like, well, maybe we just better let him go. But it's not just Pharaoh. It's easy to look at Pharaoh and the Egyptians and keeping the Israelite people in slavery and go, yeah, those people are bad people. The Israelite people, after they left Egypt, they left Egypt, they go through the Red Sea, they're in the wilderness for a while, and even they experienced times of hardened hearts where their hearts were not circumcised, where they didn't put their trust in God. Instead, what did they tell Moses? They said, hey, you know what? It'd be better if we went back to Egypt. If we go back to Egypt, we always had food. We always had a place to sleep. We were always taken care of. Let's just go back to Egypt. And so they were like, I can find my fulfillment in some kind of maybe job security. I can find my fulfillment if we go back to Egypt and everything will be okay instead of trusting in God who ultimately delivered them in the long run anyway. He gave them water. He gave them food. Food, like food from heaven. I mean, it's just like, it doesn't get much better than that. Right? But, but they did not trust that, that it was going to happen. And so this fulfillment thing, there's, there's no amount of, as Paul's talking here in this, in this section that I just read, there's no amount of religious tradition, there's no amount of correct religious practice, no amount of following the rules, no amount of getting it right, there's no amount of possessions, about money, physique, beauty, youth, there's nothing that can bring you to fullness other than Jesus. Nothing. Nothing can bring you to fullness other than than Jesus. We don't bring ourselves to fullness. Jesus does. Jesus does. So what is, what is Paul's word to the Colossians and his encouragement to them? What does it say to us? What is it that we can derive from this and take home with us today? Because this is all so far just the word to them back then. What can we bring to us today and do that as we've been talking about on Wednesday nights. How can we do that responsibly? I think the basic thing is, really, I think this one's easy to parallel. Is putting your faith in Him, putting your faith in Jesus, is what brings you to fulfillment. Putting your faith in Jesus is what will bring you to fulfillment. And just to make sure I'm clear here, what I'm talking about is not this one moment in your life. This one moment in your life where it finally clicks and you finally get it and you're finally like, you know what? Yes, Jesus. That is part of it and that is the beginning of the road. But putting your faith in Jesus is not just that one time, that one day after a Bible study, that one Sunday morning after some moving sermon, that one day at church camp, when you decide that Jesus is going to be the Lord of your life, you're like, you know what, I need to have my sins washed away, and you go through baptism and all that kind of stuff. That is a moment of putting your trust and faith in Jesus. But fullness comes through putting our faith and trust in Jesus tomorrow and next week and next month and next year, five years from now and 20 years from now. 
Fullness comes when we put our trust and faith in Jesus in all the myriad of life circumstances that may come our way. Because there's going to be a day when sickness is going to come. And, and sickness may come and it may be so bleak that death is knocking on your door. And I'm not saying if you have enough faith in Jesus, you'll get well. That's not what I'm saying. There may be financial hardship that comes. There, there may be a day that whatever kind of financial catastrophe happens in your life and you're like, this is it. This is the end. And I'm not saying that if you have enough faith in Jesus, a pile of money is going to show up on your front door. I'm not saying that. Or, or maybe it's, it's, I don't know, maybe it's a test you didn't study for, right? If I believe, if I trust enough in Jesus, I will do well on this test, whatever it is. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is God is interested in your, your eternity. God is interested in your eternity. Far, 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 far beyond this life. Now, I'm not saying that faith in Jesus today has no benefits, but I'm saying in the big scheme of things, God is interested in your eternity. And when this life is over and the next life comes, the faith that you had is going to look back on that sickness, or it's going to look back on that financial hardship, it's going to look back on that test or whatever else that has been in your life, and you're going to look back and say, man, that was small fries compared to what I'm getting now. That is small fries compared to to being with Jesus, to being with God in His glory and all that. God is interested in your eternity. And that is the thing that we need to put our faith and our trust in. Jesus is the source of our fullness. What we need to do, what I need to do, what you need to do, is to put all of your faith in Him. No matter how bleak the life situation may look. Or how awesome it may look. It's not always dark, right? No, how awesome it may look. Whatever's going on. You may be blessed beyond measure. You may have some great, wonderful thing happen. And that's great. And you should give thanks to God for that. But I hope you find your fulfillment in God and in Jesus through whom real life comes. And not in possessions and money and beauty and all those other kinds of things. Fullness comes through Jesus. That's the message for Paul to the Colossians. And that's the message for us this morning. Trust in Jesus with everything you've got. And hold on, even when you don't understand. And hope looks bleak. Hold on. All right. Let's pray and we'll be done. Lord, I thank you for blessing us. I thank you for, for sending your son to die for us. I thank you for I, I thank you for your your love for us. Lord, help us to trust in Jesus. Help us to hold fast to him and to know that I mean there's gonna be all kinds of trials and struggles and ups and downs in lives in life, but that we will keep hold of Jesus, that we will hold on tight and even when we don't understand even when people say things that aren't helpful to us um, even i don't know just whatever happens in life help us to hold fast to jesus and to trust in him and not in the things of this world help our hearts to be to be circumcised for that that sinful nature that's within us to be to be cut apart we, we know that we're imperfect. We know that we're going to fall. We know that we're going to sin. And we, we pray that you will forgive us, that you will continue to forgive us, uh, that, that we will continue to keep our hope in him, that like uh, 1 John says, that we'll, we'll walk in the light as he is in the light, that we will hold on to him, and that his blood will continually, continually cleanse us. Help the hope of Jesus to live in our lives in such a way that people see it that people see it in the, way we, in the way we behave because our belief, our foundation is Jesus. Our foundation is that faith and that hope in Him. And that through Him we will find fullness and that that will be the thing that influences our behavior. When we fall short, Lord, we ask that You forgive us. We ask You to help us to be patient with others who, who maybe do us wrong in some way. 
Help us to be patient. Help us to be forgiving of them as well. Again, in all things, Lord, I pray that you will help us to just hold tight to Jesus and find our fullness in Him and nowhere else. Nowhere else. And it's in His Son, in His name we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Thank you all.